when people see these movies, this collection of Josephine Baker movies, I want them to remember when it was in history, what time this was, the 1920s. I want them to remember that black people were just really getting their footing, true footing in this country, and the Renaissance, the Harlem Renaissance was, you know, coming, but no one had ever done what she did. The three movies of Josephine, she's always in love with a beautiful young white man who loves her well enough to make a mistress out of her, but not himself. Society, situation make that he cannot make her officially his wife. So she goes like a little bird whose wings have been cut and she finds refuge, love, affection, triumph, money, whatever you want, and maybe another lover in the theater. And that's why Joyfine is synonymous of a quintessence of show business. Josephine Baker's three films, One Silent, Two Talkies, they're fascinating to watch. Uh, they are also frustrating, and in that, as with a lot of old films, um, you know, in that lies some of the fascination. Every one uses the same um, format through some elaborate plot that always involves uh, an attractive Frenchman whom she will not be allowed to, <laughs> to marry, whose love will not be returned. Um, the love, she will love him, he will not love her in return. Nevertheless, the compensation in all three is indeed what the compensation in Josephine's life was. She becomes, or is given the opportunity to become the toast of Paris. Josephine is special in every film she made because you can see the radiance that came from her. You could see the way she projected. Again, it's very mixed what she projected. She projected childlike joy, a, a real uh, elegant beauty, and a kind of dignity, all at the same time, and sometimes a total goofiness. In Sirene des Tropiques, it's a silent film, and you have all the conventions that Hollywood had invented for silent film heroines. Silent film heroines in Hollywood, they always jump around. They jump around horribly. They always jump. They are like grasshoppers. It's something that in the teens that people decided that was really cute. So it just kept on as a convention. Well, Josephine is jumping like mad in Sirene. She jumps to the top of a clothes armoire at the beginning. She climbs a tree, she gets down from a tree, she frees a cat from a well. She does all these things that are very physical, more physical even than they have to be. The unusual part is that she's beautiful. I'm not sure she would have been filmed beautifully in an American film. She's filmed with a beautiful scarf on her head, big, big earrings, but her little face, it's kind of heart-shaped, it's wonderful, you just, you just keep staring at her. Josephine always knew what were the right movements, how not to be too jumpy, how not to be too serene. She had this amazing sense of what the physical being was, was called for in that particular moment. La Sirene de is a wonderful movie because we see there really what exploded with Josephine Talent for Europe. Of course, we have to put it back in the context of the time in which it was. It is not filmed the way we would today film it, certainly. Most of the dance scenes, which we would like to enjoy today, are shortcut and move differently. It was not a big deal for Josephine to do La Sirene des Tropiques. She was used to movies. In America, her great love was Adolf Manjou. And by now being in Paris, her lover, Pepito Abatino, a young gigolo from Italy was exactly looking like a young Adolf Manjou. 
So they were two reasons why Josephine loved him so much. Pepito really is the man who transformed the talented, wild, American Josephine Baker into what would become a Parisian and elegant. And he's the one who chose La Sirene Tropique as a vehicle for his mistress, lover, and the star which Paris and the rest of Europe love in those days. So Josephine did know about movie. She should jump herself in it like she did dancing at the Folie Bergère uh, with a belt of bananas, like if she was a little Creole coming from Africa, which many young, like Josephine, 20 years old, talented black entertainer girls would have refused to perform. Me, dancing with a belt of bananas naked? Even in those days, people knew what you were trying to say, and they would not have done it. I talked with friends of Josephine of early days. I would not have done it. Josephine Baker didn't give a damn. It was good for her. It was good for the people who care if it's not politically correct. Josephine had this ability to reconcile opposites, and she's always walking this dancing along this, this tightrope between the pleasure the French feel, you know, in fantasizing about their colonial properties and a certain anxiety that they feel about wanting to keep it a little bit at a distance. So, you know, she allows them to adore her and, and become a kind of, you know, national entertainer and yet um, would any of them want their sons to marry her? Absolutely not. So in, in some way all of this is acted out in every one of these films. In Sirene she does a lot of informal dancing. She's kind of dancing through the whole film like any silent movie actress. That's what they did instead of words. They express themselves in their bodies. But at the end, there's an amazing dance. It's maybe, I think, the greatest dance sequence that we have of Josephine, which is the Charleston. And it's carrying, it's one of those felicitous dance moments where the dance is also carrying the drama. In the film, she's fallen in love heavily and instantly with a European colonial. She's in, in the tropics, somewhere in the Caribbean. She comes to Paris after this guy. She sees his in love with someone else. And at the end, she has to swallow her grief and like so many heroines and go on living at a mad, a mad rate to drown the grief. Charleston can be a very frenetic dance. It can be very fly away, almost like speed it up. She gives you the most spacious Charleston you're ever gonna see. She just, she has a liquidity in the air, in the Charleston. So it's not fly away, it's big, it's spacious. It's Charleston on a big scale. And it's beautiful. You can't get away from this adjective with Josephine. She's statuesque, but statuesque in motion. She had the kind of impulse that great dancers have which is to use the littlest possible energy to get the biggest possible effect. It's a sixth sense that great dancers have and you feel this liquidity. You feel the movements connected with each other and you feel them big and small and they all fit together. And the Charleston is, it's sort of like the Charleston of the Mississippi. It's big, it's beautiful, it's grand. <laughs> Zuzu is my favorite of the three films because it seems to have been closest to it was closest to Josephine's heart, that's been said, but it's closest to giving her enough space to be who she really was, which was unique. She was a unique thing. She was an American poor black who had become 
a French symbol of elegance. And although Zuzu doesn't really have dancing, it has a great uh, big scale music hall number, Il n'y a qu'un homme à Paris, There is Only One Man in Paris, that also carries the drama uh, because the one man in Paris she's not going to get. She doesn't get the man in any of these movies. But in the song, she's backed by a whole lot of chorus people. And she's in a satin dress that's very tight through the torso, and yet you don't feel it's constricting. And you can see, better than any scene, the torso. The torso that was completely alive and charged, as in a great dance body. She takes, she comes down, she takes up a position with the chorus in back, and she is a dancer singing. It's beautiful. Also in Zuzu, there's the uh, number in the cage that's unforgettable, Josephine in the gilded cage. She doesn't dance, she swings inside the cage, wearing almost nothing except little white feathers in various strategic places. She is literally an exquisite bird in a gilded cage, and she is singing you know, of her longing for Haiti. And it's delicious. And at the end, she dives out into the waiting arms of male dancers. It's a straight body dive. It's like one, it's like a great Olympic dive when you can see that, you can see the flash, the whole body extended in the air before she's caught. It's a beautiful dive and it's a dance dive. Princess Tam Tam has more dance. It's a little stranger, the collection of characters. There's a Maharaja, there's lots of nasty women, there's another man who Josephine loves but won't get. And Josephine is supposed to be a, a Pygmalion kind of girl. She's supposed to be a princess, but she keeps revealing her true colors from the jungle by dancing. And there are two really good dance scenes in Princess Tam Tam. One is uh, at a bistro, and in that one you see a whole lot of styles all mixed together the way Josephine could do. She, she seems to be doing it impromptu, and she may be. She seems to be doing a bunch of Charleston moves, some trucking, some gesturing, some soft shoe, there's some nice loose soft shoe in that bistro scene. It's very intimate and nice. It's uh, something that she was, she was feeling so caged in again as a fake princess that she has to go to a bistro where people are having fun. So she starts to have fun and you feel it. What we don't see in the films, first and foremost, is a dance that goes from start to finish. We always see snippets. When she goes into a little bistro in Princess Tam Tam and does a lovely, seemingly improvised jazz dance, you know, big chunks of the dance, again, are taken up by shots of the people in the bistro. Well, this is a ridiculous thing <laughs> to not to see on camera um, when you're talking about, um, you know, a great vernacular, a great jazz, if you will, um, and music hall, music theater, dancer. You do see enough to catch you know, her, her gifts and um, her you know, charisma. But then at the end, she ruins her disguise by, it's not her fault, they ply her with champagne and she decides that she has to answer the call of the drums from the stage. She's in a supper club and she leaves her very elegant table and 
rushes onto the stage and begins to dance to the beat of jungle drums. What's odd is that the jungle drums are beating Latin beats. It's kind of a samba, not exactly from the jungle, but from the jungly South America. Josephine was a mistress of many, many dance styles all at once. So you get a lot of South America stuff, plus some more American jazz dancing at the end of Princess Tam Tam. Do I have any doubt that she could have had um, a lovely career um, in musical comedy films, in um, romantic comedies? Not for an instant. It's, it's a real loss. She had no training as an actress, but that was the thing about her. You know, like she'd fling off her shoes and fling off her clothes. She flung herself in front of a camera and said, all right, I'm going to be a movie star over here in, in, you know, in Paris. Many adjectives have been used to describe Josephine Baker. There is only one. Josephine Baker could only be Josephine Baker. And her artistic life from day one until the end is always a parallel of what we see of Joaquin on stage, the people who saw the reviews. It's always the same story, and it's come from her life. When people see these movies, it, it, it will be about her amazing presence. It will be, they should view it from the point of view that we were just coming out of silent movies. And, and what Josephine always had to depend on, one of the only things she had to depend on was what was inside her you know her instincts her spirit and so she just went with that so that they shouldn't look at it and think they're going to see an Oscar winning performance but they will be entertained definitely